So just a short bio about myself. So I made my PhD uh, many years ago. Uh, my focus at that time was on studying the properties and in particular the quadrupole moments, so which gives information on the shape of very short-lived excited states in uh, exotic nuclei. And I did that work at Louvain-la-Neuve, where at the time there was a cyclotron facility, which uh, nowadays is no longer used for research. It's only used for uh, industrial applications. So after this, uh, I started a postdoc period. And in that time, I went for one year to Ganil, which has a large uh, accelerator facility where experiments can be done with uh, fragmentation. Uh, I did develop some techniques there to study more exotic isotopes, more particular uh, produced by the fragment separator. Uh, and um, after that, uh, I became professor at the university. Uh, and since uh, the beginning of this century, I've also focused my research uh, a little bit in a different direction. Uh, starting to do experiments at CERN, at uh, Isolde, where there is uh, an experiment based on laser spectroscopy. Uh, that was uh, at the time called the collapse experiment. It's still existing. It's by now more than 40 years old. However, it's still a very competitive experiment uh, because there are continuous upgrades on that. But in the meantime, I also started together with a colleague from Manchester building a new laser spectroscopy beam line at Isolde, um, which is called uh, the collinear resonance ionization spectroscopy experiment, so CRIS, which is about a thousand times more sensitive than the experiments done at Collapse. Uh, and this we've started now to use in the last 10 years uh, very successfully. And then I was involved also with another collaborator in building a beam line for polarizing uh, the spins of uh, exotic beams using lasers. Uh, and this is now used for applications uh, at the moment for materials research, hard and soft matter, but it could also be used for other applications in the future. So currently I'm based at CERN. Uh, I'm the Isolde group leader uh, and also spokesperson for the collaboration. So if you have any further questions, you can contact me. I can give you references and so on. So Isolde is located at CERN and CERN is a big facility. You heard definitely about it. It has lots of accelerators and the most famous one is the Large Hadron Collider, which is the Bing ring here. Do you see my mouse when I move it on the screen? Yes. Yes, okay. So Isolde is located downstream, so at the very beginning of all the accelerators. So, you know, uh, there are many accelerators gradually increasing the energies of the proton beams, which are then in the LHC colliding with one another in two directions. We take beams from the booster, which have an energy of about 1.4 giga electron volt. So, Isolde is a... By the way, um, sorry, now I've lost my mouse. Damn it. This is very annoying. I will close my screen and open it again. So you will lose okay. the view, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Right. So you don't see me talking, but um, maybe this is better. At least for me, it's better. Is it okay like this? Uh, I, yes. Yeah? Okay. So um, it's, uh, it's a radioactive ion beam facility. Uh, and ISOLDA stands for Isotope Separation Online Device. So it's a method to produce and select pure beams of short-lived radioisotopes, typically half-lives down to a few milliseconds. And it's unique in the world because of the fact that we use uh, 1.4 GeV proteins to produce these isotopes. So before going to a bit more detail how this is done, let me just explain our background uh, or a playground. So we have neutrons and protons in nuclei. And if you plot them in the chart of the nuclei here, on the uh, y-axis, if you put the protons there, 
uh, every row in this axis is an element because the number of proteins in the nucleus defines which element we're talking about. For example, you have nickel, you have tin, you have lead. And if you add a certain, certain number of neutrons to the number of protons, you have an isotope. And so every row contains different isotopes of the same element. And the black squares here are the stable isotopes. There's about 300 on, there, on Earth. And the yellow colored uh, region is the radioactive isotopes, which have been produced at different facilities around the world and for which we have studied at least a few of their properties. The gray region here are the ones that have been predicted by nuclear theory, but we have, which we have not yet observed. So you see there's still a, a room for a lot of discovery. And these are isotopes which will be produced in the near future with new facilities that are for constructed. For example, the one at the, in the United States at Michigan State University, the Everett facility, facility for air isotope beam research, or the one in Europe, which is being constructed at uh, Darmstadt and GSI in Germany, uh, which is called FAIR, the facility for anti proton and ion research. So, uh, the quest in a radioactive ion beam research is, in general, to try to explain the existence and the organization of nuclear matter. So, how strong, how do the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic interactions work in the nuclear medium? How do we make bound systems of protons and neutrons? Um, but also by using precision techniques uh, with radioactive isotopes, we can look at is there physics beyond the standard model, or also what's the origin of the element? So, as you know, Gerda, there are some, there are some uh, who said that uh, the sound quality has decreased when the video. Went oh, out. okay. I will open it again. So this is then probably better. So is, is that is that okay? Is that better for Mohammed? Uh, he says yes. He says yes. Okay. So I'll try to keep it open and I hope I didn't lose my mouse again. And somehow when I close my laptop, uh, my mouse disappears uh, or sometimes. Okay. So um, as I said, the facility, uh, the radioactive ion beam facility at Isolde is unique because it's the only place where we produce radioactive ions using 1.4 GeV protons and we send those on tick targets. And, with tick, I mean really like 20 centimeter long targets. Now, if you fill the target with an, a heavy element like uranium, uh, and if you shoot with that with very intense, uh, very energetic protons, you induce a lot of different reactions like spallation, fission, and fragmentation. And due to these different uh, reactions, in fact, you just uh, smash the uranium apart in different combinations of protons and neutrons so you can produce more or less any kind of isotope in the nuclear chart. However, uh, as you can see here, the color code stands for the isotopes that we have produced and the farther we go away from stability, the more dark the colors, which means the less extent, uh, less intense are the beams. And you also see gaps. These are elements that are refractive. It means they don't like to come out of the target. So even if you hit the target to 2000 degrees, it sticks to the target. So some elements we can't produce at Isolde, but we can produce in total uh, a lot of elements of very exotic isotopes. Uh, about 1300 we have produced by now. So here you see such a target unit. So if the proton beam enters here, this is a didactic uh, vision. It's not the, the real, well, it's the real thing inside, but it's a bit, uh, the, the, the plexiglass is just for the didactic purposes. So here's the rod, which contains the pellets of the target. It can contain different elements. So one we use a lot is this uranium, uranium carbide, uh, but also tantalum, um, uh, scandium, and so on. So the thing is, depending on the element you use, you can focus on particular elements in the nuclear chart for the production. And then by heating this target, uh, they diffuse out into a very tiny tube here and into an ion source. 
And in the iron source, then we will uh, ionize the atoms that come there because these uh, nuclei that are diffusing out, they capture electrons around them and they come out as atoms, sometimes also as ions. So here you see the method how to select now one of them out of the hundreds that are being produced in such a reaction. Um, and uh, for, oops, uh, for this I will show, try to show you a movie, if it works, yes. So here you see, this is the, the target. Uh, the protons are flying through. Re exotic isotopes of different kinds are produced by shooting uh, the nuclei and the target apart. And then these are diffusing out into the ion source tube where due to some reaction, an, an electron is removed, so you get an ion. So then you can apply an electrostatic field, typically 40 to 60 kilo electron volt to accelerate it. And then it goes into a mass separator, which you see here now. Uh, and so this is a static magnetic field perpendicular. So due to the Lorentz force, you get a distribution of different species with different mass to charge ratio, but they are all having charge one. So it means we have a mass selection at the end of this device. Now, uh, even though we have a mass selection, we still want to have a better selection. And for being, having a more also element selection, we use uh, a specific type of ion source, which is based on lasers. So the resonance ionization laser ion source is used now since uh, more than 15 years at Isolde. And by shooting with lasers on the atoms in the ion source uh, with particular frequencies, you excite elements of only, uh, sorry, isotopes of only one particular element because lasers can uh, excite uh, electronic configurations for one particular element independent of the nucleus inside. So as long as the nucleus is of the same element types, has the same number of protons, you will excite it. So it means with lasers, you make a selection in the nuclear chart on the horizontal line and you ionize only isotopes of this particular element. And then you send this beam through a mass separator like here. So here you have the lasers ionizing, then you go through the mass separator, and then you make an isobaric selection in the chart like this. So by combining the two, you get iso uh, a beam of one particular isotope, and that's how you get the pure beams. Uh, there is a question from Kola. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you just go back uh, to, to the video? I just wanted to understand how the 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 the, the, the the, the, the isotopes are extracted. Oh, the, the ah, it's, uh, it's uh, by, they are accelerated and they just fly through. And so yeah. they're deviated in the magnetic field. I guess you've learned about the Lorentz force. I don't know in which uh, level you are, but this is one of the basic things in, uh, uh, in mechanics, I would say. Okay. So your question is at the end, I guess, huh? Yeah. Okay, it takes a while, so. And I'm not sure I can speed it up. No, it's okay. Okay, so here they get separated. So the ones that don't have the proper uh, mass will just bend and be hitting the walls. And the others are going into a vacuum tube. Okay, and I will show you afterwards where they end up. Is okay. that answering your question? Yeah, yeah. Please. Okay, okay. So then we go through this. So we have one isotope. So as I said, by now uh, we have produced. Uh, all these elements in the chart that you see here were very different intensities ranging from just a few per minute up to 10 to the 12 per second, so, uh, or 10 to the 10th per second. Um, so, not sure I, I will tell you history. Is that interesting for you or more on the physics? Okay, maybe a little history. So, yeah, yeah. that'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so the Isolde uh, facility was constructed at CERN as one of the very first experiments, in fact. 
Uh, so CERN started, I think, in the late 50s, in the 50s, late 50s. And Isolde uh, got accepted as a project in 64, and the first radioactive beams were already produced in 67. Of course, since then, there have been many upgrades on the facility. This was here a simple room in the beginning. Then there was new rooms constructed in 74, in 88. And in 92, we got a whole new facility, which was connected to a new accelerator, which is now still the one that is being used, with, which is the, the booster. So here you see a picture from the inside of the current Isolde hall, with lots of different experimental setups. And this hall got extended to the back over there in 2000 to also make place for a, a superconducting and a normal conducting linear accelerator. <coughs> so here you see um, how the protons enter in Isolde. They can be sent on two different target stations. These are then coupled to the ion source. This, of course, is connected. This is just a sketch. And then here you have a high resolution mass separator, as I showed you, this is one with a high resolution to get a pure, a pure beam. Here we have a separator with less good resolution, we can have more beams at the same time. And then these are distributed in the different beam lines uh, of the facility. All these beams here are sent to different experimental setups at the end of each of the beam lines, and they have energies of the order of 40,000 uh, electron volts. We can now, as I said, also post-accelerate them, and the post-accelerator is then constructed here. So now I will go to that. So here the beams are first uh, more ionized because to accelerate ions, if they have a higher charge state, it's more efficient. So first they go from one plus to n plus, several n's. Uh, so we rip off a few electrons. And then they go into a normal conducting accelerator, followed by four superconducting cavities uh, to go up to energies of nine and a half MeV per nucleon. So with this here, we have done three experimental setups, which can be used to see reactions of radioactive ion beams. For example, the ones that take place in the stars. So Isolde is a collaboration which consists of many countries. Um, and you see that uh, South Africa is also there. It's one of the major non-European participants in our uh, collaboration. And in fact, it's the only non-European country who is officially also a member of our collaboration. So that means uh, members from South Africa can be the sole spokespersons and leading experiments at Isolde. And the community is mostly involved with uh, solid state physics and also a little bit with nuclear reaction studies. Um, a diverse, we have a diverse research program going from uh, nuclear structure through beta decay, uh, measuring the ground state properties like the mass of the nuclei, the charge uh, radius, so the, the size of the nuclei. Uh, we also have applied uh, experiments in the field of solid state physics, medical physics and biophysics. So they use isotopes as spies to look in the interior of the uh, elements. And then we have also with the post accelerator uh, reaction experiments uh, using different ex uh, types of uh, yeah, reactions, let's say. So first I will show you a few experiments from radioactive ion beams. So um, these experiments are performed like this. So you have a radioactive projectile that hits a target. And then depending uh, on how far the target is, uh, the nucleus in the beam is from the target nucleus. This is called the impact parameter. You can have different types of nuclear reactions. And this, of course, will also depend on the beam energy. Uh, while the impact parameter will define how the particle is scattered. So by measuring uh, the scattered target uh, and projectile uh, nuclei uh, and the angle at which they are emitted, as well as the emitted uh, radiation from the decay of the pro produced or excited target or beam nuclei, you can study the properties of the nuclear reaction. So, uh, initially, we had an accelerator which was not very high in energy, and with such an accelerator, you can only study Coulomb excitation uh, reactions. So, um, 
this has been used, and I will show an example, to study, for example, the vibrational or rotational behavior of nuclei or, or the shape of nuclei. Uh, you can also perform scattering experiments. Uh, I'm not sure I have an example of this, but here you can study, for example, the reactions that take place in the stars. So these experiments are typically done to, for astrophysics uh, purposes. And then since a few years, we now can also accelerate to very high energies, typically five to 10 MeV per nucleon. And then you can make transfer reactions. So in these experiments, you will uh, send a, a beam on, on a target nucleus and the two nuclei will exchange a number of nucleons. And again, by looking at the, sky, uh, at the different particles that come out of the reaction, you can tell a lot about the uh, structure of the uh, of the beam that has been sent onto the target. So it's a way to look into the in interior of the radioactive projectiles and to learn about its structure. Um, the uh, detection system that is used for these reactions, uh, the one that is still used now and was uh, initiated from the start when the accelerator was built is called the mini ball detector. Uh, I know in Itemba labs they have also this kind of uh, detection systems I think in South Africa. Um, so it consists of um, a detector of uh, clusters of germanium capsules. So every cluster has three germanium crystals which are encapsulated together. So you can make a very compact size detector, as you see here, covering a lot of the solid angle. So it's built around a vacuum chamber, which is then connected to the beam pipe. So it has a very high efficiency, at least at the time this was high, now you have even higher efficiencies available. And then inside this vacuum chamber, you can also put a particle detector to look uh, at the emitted uh, nuclei or the scattered nuclei, either from the target or from the beam. Here's a nice photograph again. So here, and I lost my mouse again. Sorry, I will close my screen and open it again. So, um, a lot of experiments were performed with this uh, uh, first uh, low energy beam experiments. This is just a few examples, uh, but let me just go show you one example. Uh, this was the acceleration of isotopes of radium. And radium isotopes are very heavy. They are located here in the nuclear chart. They have a lot of protons and neutrons. Um, and by exciting those uh, nuclei, you can look, uh, get information on their shape. So uh, here in this experiment, it was found that there, the, these nuclei are octopole deformed, so they are pear-shaped. Uh, and this was done by looking at the transition probability and also at what is called the nuclear uh, quadrupole deformation parameter and the octopole deformation parameter. Uh, and this was extracted by looking at the intensities of the gamma rays that were emitted uh, here with this detector here. So by measuring the gamma intensities, information could be reduced on the nuclear shape. Um, now an example of more recent experiments. Um, from Heiselde. Uh, so the first beams were accelerated with this new accelerator in 2016. And since then, we have been running a lot of experiments every year with uh, ever all the time increasing energies. Um, just to show why it was important to get higher energies, even for uh, reactions like Coulomb excitation, which we could do before already. Here you see a spectrum for uh, a zinc 74 beam. So this is a very neutron rich zinc beam uh, that was studied initially with an energy of 3.8 MeV per nucleon. So this is the red spectrum that you see here. And uh, this here is the uh, energy, the gamma intensities uh, observed uh, from uh, the target and the uh, beam nuclei that get excited. So for example, here is a peak that comes from the target nucleus, which was platinum that got excited. 
And here is a beak that comes from the beam nucleus that got excited, so the zinc 74. Now, it's, this one in particular is of interest in this study, and the red spectrum was uh, counted during 16 hours with the low energy beam, while the blue spectrum was counted in just five hours, getting to almost the same peak intensity with the high energy beam. So just three times less beam time was needed to gain to the same statistics in the experiment, which is very important. But more important is that if you look at, I lost my mouse again. If you look at this peak here, which was here in, is in March here, you could not see it in the first experiment, but now you can clearly see a peak here in the second experiment. And here is the level skip. So this is the first excited state that you observe with low energies. And if you have a bit higher energies, you can also produce this higher excited level. And that gives you a lot more information about the nucleus, in particular about its uh, quadrupole deformation. So again, I will just show a selection of experiments from that. Uh, and I want to show the first publication from Heisolder. This was a study of the doubly magic TIN-132 nucleus. So it has uh, 50 protons and 82 neutrons and the nuclear structure. These are magic number of nucleons. So like in uh, atoms, uh, in nuclei, you can have uh, magic numbers. So in atoms, you have the, the noble gases that are more, have more stable electron configurations. And in nuclei, you have a similar uh, stability, which is uh, induced for particular numbers of protons and neutrons. And 50 and 82 are those numbers. So 32 uh, tin is what is called doubly magic. However, it's very neutron rich. And it was, this, uh, it was predicted by some nuclear theories in the past, before we could study it, that it might not be doubly magic anymore because it's very, very neutron rich. However, more and more experiments were done at some point showing that, in fact, indeed, this nucleus is doubly magic. And so this experiment here was also aiming at that study. So in this experiment, it was possible to excite, I'm trying to have my mouse, I'm sorry. So here, a beam of 132 tin was produced um, by injecting the target with sulfur molecules because tin by itself doesn't like to uh, come out of the target fuzzy very easily, uh, but by combining it with sulfur, it gets volatile and it gets uh, easily out of the target. So you can get beams with intensities of about 10 to the 5 tin 32 uh, ions per second, and they were accelerated to about 5 MeV per nucleon. Uh, and then again, you see the gamma spectrum. So here you see the gamma counts, the photon counts in the gamma detector as a function of the photon energy. Note that this is very high energy. So in the previous, I showed you energies of a few hundred keV. Here we are looking at energies of a few thousand uh, keV, so MeVs. Uh, and that's the first excited states of this thing. And the fact that this energy is so high is one of the first signatures to show that this is indeed a doubly magic nucleus. It's really very difficult to excite the, that, this isotope. And then the probability that to make that excitation, that's the intensity here, uh, gives information uh, again on the shape and the robustness. And so from comparing these numbers to shell model calculations, it was concluded that this is indeed a doubly magic nucleus. Um, okay, then there was a... Continue. Could you explain a bit again what are the properties that make a nuclear uh, magic and double magic? Oh yes, that's uh, maybe interesting. Uh, I wasn't sure this would be known or not. So, um, uh, so, wait, maybe I should, well, I can't go, I don't have a slide on it, so let's just... Uh, try to explain it like this. So, um, so protons and neutrons in the nucleus, um, are, they are, it's a quantum system. So in an atom, we know that the electrons are surrounding uh, the nucleus as a cloud of electrons. And because of the Coulomb interaction, uh, you can solve the Schrodinger equation. And then you find that these electrons, in fact, are sitting in quantum orbits. 
And this gives rise to, uh, for example, in the noble gases, the quantum orbits are like in a closed shell, and this gives a more stable structure. Now, in nuclei, the protons and the neutrons also interact with each other, also through the electromagnetic interaction, so that's the protons, they are positively charged, but the neutrons and the protons interact also through the strong force, and that's why you, you still can have a bond system. That force you can also model in a similar way, uh, and you can uh, also describe it in a similar way as in atoms, as the electrons in atoms. Now you look at one nucleon in the central potential of this nuclear force, which also induces quantum orbits. And this uh, gives rise again to shells like you have in the atoms, but now for the nucleons. So you have the same, you have shells for protons and you have shells for neutrons. And that gives then for some uh, number of nucleons uh, shell gaps, and these are then the magic nuclei. It's, I hope it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's not in all details, but I hope this is a little bit answering the question. Sure, sure, go ahead, please. Okay, so, um, right. So what I wanted to say is that once we had higher energies, we, uh, we looked at, uh, again, these uh, very uh, heavy nuclei to look if there's other nuclei that have a <coughs> And in fact, it turned out that, uh, radon isotopes are not static uh, peer shapes, but they oscillate the whole time. And again, this was from an observable, I can't go into details here, maybe that's a little bit too much detail, so I'll skip, I'll skip this and move on to the next uh, example. So here, uh, I want to show another example. So this is from uh, the Isolde solenoid experiment. So this one was installed in 2017 and the experiment, the first experiment was done in 20, uh, 2018. So just before CERN uh, had a very long shutdown because currently CERN is not providing any beans since uh, January 2019. Uh, it's uh, going through an upgrade phase. The, some of the accelerators also, Isolde is not getting beans. And so this experiment was done just before the shutdown. So this is a big superconducting magnet in fact, it was an MRI magnet from a hospital in uh, Brisbane, in Australia, and it was, was transported to Isolde in 2017 and then refurbished. Uh, the inner part was taken out so that we can put detectors inside. Uh, and now uh, with this, we can do experiments that are a little bit like the experiments. So what you do in such an experiment, so you have a beam of a uh, radioactive beam, like mercury 206, and if you send it uh, on a target which is placed here inside this uh, strong magnetic field, which is along this axis in the magnet, um, then uh, when it reacts with the target, there will be an emission of particles. So if you send it, for example, on a deuteron tar uh, a target that contains deuteron atoms, then it's possible that this uh, work picks up uh, a neutron to form 207 mercury. And then in that reaction remains a proton because deuteron is a proton plus a neutron. So if you remove uh, a neutron by picking it up here, you remain with a proton. And these two are then scattered and sent out uh, from the target and they will spiral inside the magnet of the magnetic field and then they can spiral onto some detectors which are placed here. So this is a set of detectors uh, and there, there's a, a hole inside where the beam can pass through. And you can also detect the remaining fragments that go through in the detector here or, or the gamma's, for example. Yeah, that, that is a question. Yeah. You want to ask your question? Um, how do you choose your target? I mean, it's like, um, whether it's, is it uh, deuterium or any other element? Yes. So it depends on the reaction you want to study. For example, in transfer reactions, what you typically want to do is to populate particular levels in the next isotope by picking up a neutron that will end up in a particular neutron single particle orbital. So for that, it means you will use, choose a target that is very simple, that has just one proton and one neutron. So deuterium, deuterium. of course, deuterium yeah. 
mass itself, it doesn't exist as a target. So in fact, the target is what is called it, um, a deuterium loaded titanium target. So what they do is they shoot deuterium, uh, a deuterium beam into a solid very thin foil of titanium. And then uh, in this reaction, you get of course also a reaction on the titanium, but that one you can then separate by looking at the reaction products. Uh, so that's how you choose the target. In Coulomb excitation, for example, you will typically choose a heavy target because there the Coulomb field, because of the many nucleons in the heavy target, will be more strong than in a very uh, light target, for example. So it depends on the reaction you want to study. Okay. Okay. So here uh, they detect then the number of protons that are emitted on the y axis as a function um, of the, uh, the position of the detector here. And this can then be converted as a function of the energy of the protons uh, in the lab. <coughs> and if the detector would be not in a field, but just a plain detector like we had in the past, then these peaks appear very close to one another. And each peak here represents a level in the 207 mercury isotope. So in this isotope here, an excited state. Uh, so you see they are not always well resolved like these two here, whereas you do it in a magnetic field, they get much better separated. And so you can much, do much more precise experiments. So this was the first experiment that was done. And in fact, this was the for the first time that information could be obtained on excited states of this nucleus. Now this nucleus here, in the nuclear chart, it's located here. So it's very close, in fact, to the doubly magic 208 lead. So this is here. This is 82 protons and 126 neutrons. So these lines <coughs> in the chart are the lines with magic protons or neutron numbers. And so 207 mercury is here. So 206 is unstable, it's this, this was the beam. And then we looked for the first time at excited states in this radioactive isotopes by exciting them in that reaction. So here you see a bit more about the targets. In fact, because it's a very thin foil that you have to use, uh, sorry, it's not uh, uh, titanium, it's polyethylene. So it's a very, very thin foil of polyethylene, which is loaded with uh, deuter de deuterium. Uh, so, and they had in that experiment 30 of these foils on such a system, and then they could move them around during the experiment because due, of, due to the heat hitting with the beam, the target was deteriorating very quickly. And so they had a clever system in the vacuum inside the bore of the magnet that they could move around during the experiment. Uh, and so here you see a typical spectrum. So here, this is the protons that are counted as a function of the proton energy in these detectors. And you see different excited states. So this in fact is the ground state of mercury. And then by looking also at the angular distribution and so on, they could get information on the spins of these states. And, the st uh, and so this gives us the first hint of levels in this isotope. It also, um, yeah, that's it. Okay, now let's switch to something else because I'm, my time is running fast, I see. So we also uh, do a lot of experiments with low energy beams. And here you see um, uh, the different experimental setups that use low energy beams. Uh, this, I mean, lower than 60 kilo electron volt. This is the old Isolde facility and it's still a very powerful facility. And there's a large variety of experiments with this kind of beams. They go from solid state physics to laser spectroscopy experiments, mass measurements with a panning trap, uh, decay spectroscopy with a dedicated decay station, uh, a new beam line here to polarize the beams, which is called VITO and the wizard experiment, which looks for physics beyond the standard model. So here uh, you see a little bit more um, the different experiments. So as I said, we have mass measurements using a panning trap and a uh, multi-reflection time of flight spectrometer. We have decay spectroscopy with a very dedicated but very versatile uh, spectroscopy station, which can be sensitive to uh, different uh, decay properties like 
gamma rays, uh, beta decays, alpha decays, neutrons. So this wall here that we see is a big neutron wall detector. Uh, and it's set up as needed for a particular experiment. Then we have different experiments based on lasers. And we have also, uh, as I said, a big uh, setup for fundamental interactions, which is currently being uh, upgraded, and a lot of different experiments for materials research. So now I will just try to give you a glimpse of a few of those in the remaining 15 minutes or 20 minutes. So the um, we can test the standard model at low energy by doing precision studies. And this experiment here is aiming at measuring the, cor uh, the correlation yes, between the beta particle that is emitted from radioactive argon isotopes and the subsequent uh, proton particle that follows that beta decay. So this is called beta delayed proton decay. And this process here can give us information on the correlation between the beta particle and the neutrino that is also emitted in this process, but which we can't detect. So it's a clever way to look at the beta neutrino correlation. And so the beta particle is detected in this scintillator here, and then the protons that are emitted are detected in silicon detectors uh, that are on the opposite side. So the, the beam comes from here, hits the catcher where it's collected and then it decays and the particles are detected uh, and measured. And this whole thing takes place in a field of about four tesla. Now, in uh, beta decay, in the standard model here, the beta decay is what is called a vector type beta decay. And it means that if it decays, if the particle decays, the um, the beta particle uh, is, uh, sorry, the electron is emitted um, in a direction which is mostly um, in such a way that the, the sorry, that the, the nucleus gets a kick in this direction. So this is what is, what is the vector current. Whereas uh, in beyond standard model physics, there's another type of beta decay which is where particles are emitted like more back to back, and then the nucleus gets a lot less decay, and this is called a scalar current. So by looking if the particle gets a big uh, kick or a smaller kick, you can uh, get, try to be sensitive to this uh, beyond standard models uh, effects. So <coughs> at the moment, they are just still trying to set up the experiment and I did a first proof of principle. Um, and here you see that they are sensitive to these shifts, which can, could, could give them information uh, on a possible deviation from the standard model. However, of course, at this level of precision, they are fully consistent with the standard model. This correlation coefficient is one for Fermi decays and is 0.23 for gamma stellar decays, and as you can see within the error bar, they are fully consistent. But the goal is to improve the precision in the setup, and they are currently working on that, to go to, in that instead of having 0.3% uh, precision, they want to go to 0.1% uh, precision. And so that, then they should become sensitive to this new physics. On the mass measurements, uh, I would like to show an example from an experiment that was done also quite recently, just before the shutdown. And this was to study uh, the masses of very neutron-rich uh, barium and cesium isotopes. Uh, no, sorry, on very neutron-rich cadmium isotopes. Now, these cadmium isotopes... There's another question there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, how possibly, how possibly uh, the precision could be improved? I mean... Can uh, you repeat your question? Yeah, how possibly uh, the precision could be improved? Ah, how much it could be improved in this experiment here? Uh, they think they can get to this precision. And how to do it is, uh, first of all, this was a, a proof of principle experiment with a proof of principle setup. So the setup was very, very simple, not at all sophisticated. So very simple beta and uh, 
proton detectors were used. So they are currently installing more efficient detectors uh, and more so, with more solid angles, so more, e uh, more efficient, yeah. Uh, that's one thing, but they also have to control a lot more uh, the systematic errors. So they will build a more efficient setup, have a lot more uh, data collection time because there, this was just a few hours of data collection. So they improve on the statistical error like that by a factor of 10 at least. And then they will also have to improve on the systematic error by doing careful measurements to look what could influence that. And their goal is to reach a total of 0.1%. Okay. okay. So, um, mass measurements at uh, CERN are done with two uh, techniques. One is in the panning trap and one is in uh, uh, a multi-reflection time of light spectrometer. I'm sorry, I should have shown a little bit more uh, the setups as well. Uh, um, so, I'm showing the results. Uh, that, I'm sorry for that. I should have included that. I realize that now. Um, so anyway, in this, uh, this device allows you to send the radioactive isotopes back and forth uh, in, in an electric field. And by doing so, uh, like thousands of times, after a while, the isotopes with different masses are separated from one another. And then you send them on a detector to detect them. Uh, and so by measuring their flight time after a certain time, you can... Uh, distinguish these two and, and then the, the difference in time between the two gives the uh, measure for the mass, let's say. Uh, and so this was an experiment that allowed to measure a very exotic isotope, which is close to the 132 tin, in fact. It has just two protons less and two neutrons less than 132, uh, no, one proton less and one, no, two protons less. Yeah, and two neutrons more. Yeah. So it's a very neutron rich cadmium isotope uh, that they could measure the mass of. And again, this was to probe the magicity of this N equals uh, 82 shell closure. And uh, here, for in that same experiment, they also studied 129 cadmium, which has then again two protons less than tin, but also one neutron less than. Uh, N equals 82. So uh, this is with the neutron hold configuration. And indeed, in this uh, nucleus, you have different uh, long-lived states. So one state uh, has a spin of 11 halves minus, and the other state turned out to have a spin of 3 halves plus. And this thing was measured in another experiment, which I will, I hope I have an, ex uh, an example of that. So this was in a laser spectroscopy experiment. By looking at the, uh, the spectra there, we could identify the spins of the, the different states. Here, they could measure the different masses uh, by using a very special technique that they developed in the panning trap. I'm sorry, I can't go into details of the technique, but you can see nicely from this picture that the two uh, species within that same isotope are clearly distinguished here. And the mass difference gives the excitation energy of the two states relative to one another. And they could show that um, this 11 half state, which is isomeric in all the less exotic cadmium isotopes, becomes the ground state here in this cadmium isotope. And that is the only way to do that. It's through this mass measurement. Um, so in this study, another result from this study was, as I said, to look at how big is this gap if you remove protons from 132 tin. So here is the cadmium. So if you remove protons, you want to know how big remains the shell gap here at n equals 82. And this is done here by plotting their results. They put the binding energy of the neutron, so the mass of the, nu of the nuclei here, is related to how strong the neutrons are bound to this uh, closed shell uh, nucleus, which is in this case 130 cadmium. And so by looking how, how hard they are bound or how little they are bound, you can get information on how strong is, uh, how big is this shell gap here. And that is shown here. So you see the last data points that were added here are for the cadmium. They have 48 protons 
and you see that while the gap remains more or less constant, if you add protons to, one, uh, to 132 here, it's a bit bigger at 132 and then it reduces again. So it gets a little bit smaller and this will definitely have impact on the structure of uh, these isotopes in this region. And this is now uh, going to be compared to, to new calculations. Do I still have some time? Yes, I still have some time. Um, so another type of experiment. There are another question. Yes, sorry. Can you repeat the question? Oh, there is no question. Ah, there is no question. Okay, good. So then um, another type of experiments are laser spectroscopy experiments. And uh, at Isolde we have two types of uh, experiments with lasers, the ones which are in collinear geometry. So in these experiments, we overlap the accelerated beam with laser beams. And this allows us to achieve a reasonably high resolution, like 50 to 60 megahertz uh, line width in the spectrum. And we can also make very sensitive experiments uh, by using bunched beams. Uh, and then uh, making a gate between the fluorescence from the excited atom. So look at the light that is emitted from the laser excited atom with uh, when the beam is in front of the detectors. And so this is done at the collapse experiment. Or we can even enhance the sensitivity of the experiments by uh, not doing um, one step excitation, but two step laser excitation, so resonance ionization. Uh, and then detect ions. And that is a more sensitive technique because it is uh, almost background free. And so it allows to study very exotic species like ions that are just produced at 20 per second. There's also a laser experiment in the eye. Okay, another question, Gerda. Yes. Uh, what, what, is a, what is a bunched beam? Ah, what is a bunched beam? A bunched beam uh, we achieve at Isolde so when the beam comes out of the target, first of all, you would think it's bunched because the protons that are impacting on the target at Isolde, they come, there's a proton pulse about every 2.4 seconds. Now, for the ions to get out of the target, uh, the elements, it takes a time. And this time varies between milliseconds and up to seconds, depending on the element. So if you have an element that is released only after a second or so, it means that you get more or less a continuous beam of ions from our ion source, okay? Um, but then in some experiments, you want to have these uh, ions in a short time, like a few microseconds. So what we do, we send it in a pole trap, a linear pole trap, this, um, and this allows us to bunch the beam. So bunching means, means that in electric, uh, and uh, RF fields, we make the, we collect them, we have a potential, we collect them, they come in, and then after a while, you close the, the trap and then you release them in a very short growth of a few microseconds. So that's what you call a bunched beam, okay? So it's a collection of all the ions in a very short time. And that is very interesting because now, uh, if this bunched beam interacts with your lasers, you can put a time gate on the photons that are emitted from uh, that excited beam in that microsecond time range. And you can really get rid of all the other photons that are flying around due to the laser. So it gives a lot of signal to background gain. And that was a very important break breakthrough for this experiment. But also for this experiment, you need bunched beams. Uh, because you can use pulsed lasers in a very efficient way by synchronizing the laser pulse, which is used in resonance ionization spectroscopy, with the ion bunch that is in your uh, beam line. Okay? Okay, yeah. So we also can do spectroscopy with our resonance ionization laser ion source. Uh, and the advantage of this doing this is that it's even more efficient than this technique here because you can do it immediately in the ion source. It has a drawback that the resolution is quite low. So here 
you only have four gigahertz resolution as compared, you see it's a, almost a factor of 100 less good resolution. Um, so here, this is only possible to study uh, the atomic spectroscopy of elements that have a very long, a very broad hyperfine structure like heavy elements. Okay. So here are again a few examples. This is from the collinear resonance ionization spectroscopy experiment. So in this experiment, they wanted to look at the um, charge radii, how they change. So this is the, the, the mean squared charge radii as a function of the number of neutrons in copper isotopes. Now, sorry, read this. Um, in copper isotopes, uh, copper isotopes have 28, uh, 29 uh, protons. Sorry, this should be Z here, that's a typo. Uh, and that is one more than the magic number of 28 protons. And um, so um, by probing the properties of the copper isotopes, we can get information on the magicity of uh, proton number 28. And copper isotopes have also a few neutron uh, magic numbers. So there's a magic number of 28 neutrons here, and there's a magic number of 50 neutrons there, and there's even what is called a subshell closure of 40 neutrons here. So these are all uh, single particle orbitals in, in the shell model, uh, and with copper, we can cover the whole range here experimentally. Uh, now, in this particular experiment, we wanted to go to the very neutron-rich ones, approaching as close as possible to the very exotic double magic 78 nickel, which is just uh, one neutron more and one proton less than 78 copper here. And um, so this was possible due to really a lot of improvements in this experimental setup. Uh, but the interesting thing was that we found that you see there's a staggering in this the radii, which is on top of a big structure, because normally you would expect that it kind of increases linearly the radius of the nucleus as you add more neutrons. But in fact, there's some structure there, and this is the odd even staggering. This is quite well known, uh, this odd even staggering. But we saw that when we approach n equals 50 here, but suddenly the staggering disappears. And then it was interesting to compare that to modern state-of-the-art theories like density functional theories, also uh, some modern ab initio theories uh, to try to understand this. And it was found that this is related to the inversion of the proton single particle orbitals, which happen as neutrons are filling here uh, a specific neutron orbital. So this was studied with these uh, measurements. Okay, I'll skip this because it's a little bit too detailed. And then I go to another nice result. Uh, this was from uh, in-source laser spectroscopy. And this is something that builds on, on years of uh, studies at Isolde because already in 86, it, well, in fact, already early 80s, the first signatures we formed. Here again, you have the mean squared charge radii. So it's a measure for the size of the isotopes of mercury. They have 80 protons, so they are just below the magic Z equals 82 gap, so just below the lead isotopes here, it's this chain here. Um, and their charge radii were measured already in the early 80s, and it was found that there's a gradual decrease as you remove neutrons from the stable mercury, the charge radius decreases but not as much as you would expect from a simple model where you look at the nucleus as a liquid drop. So it was a little bit increasing. But the very interesting thing was that at some, in some isotopes, suddenly you got a very big uh, increase in the charge radius. And then it goes normal again and it increases again and so on. So this was found already in the 80s and it was called shape staggering. Uh, and it was uh, suggested that this was related to the fact that uh, you had uh, in some isotopes suddenly instead of a, a pancake shape isotope, you have a, a rugby ball shape isotope. And this was proposed at the time, but it wasn't really uh, microscopically calculated. Uh, so 
recently, uh, at Isolde, we were able to repeat that experiment with a much more sensitive setup and using a lot of different uh, detection stations. So in this experiment, the 1.4 protons beams from ICERN were hitting the target, which in this case was molten lead. So this is a very efficient way to produce the mercury isotopes, which are just having two protons less. And then these mercury isotopes are sent into an ISO, uh, an ion source where they are laser excited with the three different laser beams in order to excite uh, the, the mercury isotopes. And then by scanning one of the laser beams, you can get the hyperfine. I'm really sorry. I I want to show you something because I have a very nice slide with some spectra in my other talk from this morning. So anyway, uh, the nice thing was that they could study a whole chain of isotopes uh, in this and uh, they could repeat the measurements and I will really switch to my presentation of the morning. Uh, we'll come back with my sharing in a moment because I will show you a better presentation of this. Uh, voila. And okay. Okay. Show this voila. And now I start sharing again. Uh -huh. Voila. Okay. So let's hope it works. I will stop sharing first. First, I will put it in presentation mode. This was the mistake I made in the morning. I oh, don't know, it doesn't work. Oh, why not? Okay. Okay, so I'm sorry I can't put it in presentation. Like I don't know why. Not. Do you see my screen? Yeah, we do. I think it is fine. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, here it's a bit better explained. So, with the different laser colors, you excite one by one the different atomic states. And then, if you have enough energy in the end, you rip off one. Uh, electrons, so you get an, a positively charged ion. And then these are separated in the magnet here, and then every different mass, uh, depending on the field in the magnet, you can select a particular isotope with a particular mass. And then you can send it in different beam lines here, uh, to which different detection stations are coupled. So this can be just a Faraday cup if you have a very intense isotope of let's say a few picoamps of intensity, you can measure it in a Faraday cup. Or if it's a, a beam of uh, mercury isotopes where there's a lot of contamination, you can use the multi-reflection time of flight mass spectrometers, send it back and forth, and then detect it in the end to uh, detect such a spectrum as a function of the laser frequency. Or you can even send it on a thin carbon foil, which is surrounded by silicon detectors on what we call a mill, windmill to look at the alpha decay, which is also a very sensitive uh, technique to look at the decay. And so by doing that, you get uh, what we call the hyperfine spectrum. And then, sorry, voila. So in this experiment, they could then measure a whole series of isotopes uh, of mercury um, and uh, the, the get from the hyperspine spectrum, uh, get these isotope shifts. You see that the center of this spectrum is changing as you go to more neutron rich isotopes or in the other way around. So this is the stable mercury. And if you remove neutrons, you see that the spectrum shape and the position is changing. The interesting thing is that this is done with just 0.03 ions per second of resonance. So these are really very low count rate experiments. So to analyze those type of spectra, you need also to develop different uh, dedicated techniques, not based on the chi-square analysis, like we all know very well, but on the likely uh, maximum likelihood minimization uh, techniques, which here are, have been developed in the SATLAS package. So 
Here I show the result from this experiment. Uh, so the, the black line are the charged radii of the lead isotopes. And so if you remove two protons, you see that the, the, the black dot lines are the data that I showed you before, they were known. Uh, and they are very similar to the lead. And then you see this sudden staggering which appears here. So this was repeated and this was confirmed. These are the new data in red. But now you could, they could extend the measurements to much more exotic neutron deficient mercuries, seen, uh, showing that it goes back to like quasi normal. And so this is interesting because then the question is why in these three isotopes here, suddenly the shape changes completely. And this was understood then uh, from uh, theories. Uh, so for the first time, it was possible to perform really large scale shell model calculations. These are really calculations that take into account all the configuration mixing uh, in all the possible uh, quantum orbits uh, in this uh, very exotic systems. And they could show why the shape suddenly changes from an oblate in these ones here with a very low charge radius and then to oblate in the ones that have this uh, very large charge radius. Uh, and this was really a, a very nice work to complete, let's say, 30 years of research at Isolde. Okay, then uh, I already showed you results from Chris, but uh, let me go to one of our last measurements that we did at CRIS. And for that, let me just explain indeed briefly the CRIS setup uh, here. Um, so in the cornea resonance ionized, can I have 10, five more minutes? Yeah, please, sure. Sorry, I'm sorry but that- There is a question me. though. Oh, okay, yeah. Make it. Can, you can ask your question? Yeah. Uh, so it's like, uh, to which nuclear model uh, the shape is staggering belong? Because um, this is the first time to hear about it. The shape is staggering. Yeah. So which nuclear model? Um, so this was, in this particular paper, they used the, the shell model. But the shell model um, in heavy nuclei is very, was, was until now impossible to make calculations because uh, in, uh, in these calculations you want to what they do is they, to, to be computationally possible, they assume a certain core uh, of nucleons that do not interact with the, the rest of the valence nucleons. And so in this very heavy nuclei, you have a lot of valence nucleons and it was computationally impossible. And that's why they used the Monte Carlo shell model, which uh, is a technique to look which of the configurations are the most relevant for that particular nucleus. And that's the development that was done by uh, Otsuka and his collaborators in Japan. This existed already for uh, several years, this model, but he and his team could apply it for the first time to such very heavy nuclei like uh, mercury. Yeah. Is that yes, a thank you. question? Yeah, yeah, indeed. Okay, okay. So now let me go uh, to the CRIS experiment. Um, that's the experiment that we used for the disappearing or even staggering of the copper radii. I want just to briefly explain you the technique because I want to show you one last example with this that was very brand new and, and will open a lot of perspectives for the future. So in this experiment, we have again a bunched beam that comes from Isolde. So bunched means really like a five mic microsecond long bunch of ions. It's sent into a vacuum tube, it's, which is the Chris beam line. Uh, and in this experiment, it's first sent through a charge exchange cell. So in this one is filled with uh, a vapor of sodium or potassium, which likes to uh, give away an electron to the positively charged ions that are there. So then we get a neutral atom uh, for example, if this is copper, it comes in as an ion and then it gets a neutral copper. Then this is a beam that's, which has an energy of about 40 keV and so it just flies through and the remaining ions are deflected. So we have here a voltage and we deflect the, the remaining ions. So here we have a pure neutral beam of copper atoms in this case, for example. 
This is a differential pumping section. So we go from 10 minus 8 millibar to 10 minus 10 millibar. And then in this region here, at ultra high vacuum or as good as possible vacuum, we overlap the uh, atoms with lasers. And again, we tune the lasers to scan the hyperfine structure of from the ground state to the excited state. And then we apply a second laser to ionize the beam. So then this ion beam, now again, it becomes red, it's ions again. So you can again apply a voltage, this is done here with these plates and deflect the ions onto a detector. While everything which was not ionized is just going straight ahead. So it means that all the ions that arrive here on the detector are, have been inresonantly uh, excited by this laser scheme. So you get a very pure uh, ion bunch here of the isotopes you're interested in. And you can get very nice, uh, very clean spectra uh, of these isotopes. Now I want to go to an example that we used this experiment for recently. And this was the first spectroscopy on radioactive molecules. So this was a very particular and difficult experiment um, because um, is it also visible like this? Because with the animation, it's a bit nicer for me to show it. Yes. It's acceptable? Okay. So um, here we had a lot of unknowns. This was really a very difficult and challenging experiment uh, because we had never produced molecules uh, like radium fluoride before at Isolde. So to produce them, we injected uh, CF4 gas in the target hoping that the, the radioactive isotopes that are produced in the ion source would react with the radium. And that happened indeed. So then this radioactive molecule, radium fluoride is formed. It's ionized by surface ionization. And then it is sent to uh, our ion trap where we cool down the molecules to form a bunch. But we didn't know if it would survive this cooling in, with the helium buffer gas, but it did survive. Then it's sent into the charge exchange cell because we want to do spectroscopy on the neutral radium fluoride. So we didn't know if it would survive the interaction with the sodium vapor. So this also was successful. And then we overlapped it with laser beams to look at the hyperfine structure or at the fine structure or the spectroscopy of the molecule. Now here, we had to fully rely on uh, quantum chemistry calculations because nothing was known. So the theory predicted the wavelength of the first excited state would appear in the range of 740 to 800 nanometers, which is an incredibly large range to scan. And we also didn't know how much energy we would have to put in the laser beam to ionize the molecule again, to go to deflect it then into our detection system here. So the positively excited ones go in the detector, the other ones go straight. So again, we relied on theory. Uh, so to make the successful experiment, the team installed three independent laser uh, setups. So to be able to scan three laser regions at the same time. And they sent the beams once collinear and once anticollinear, which means that due to the Doppler shift, you even scanned six regions at the same time. And in fact, due to this very, much, uh, very good preparation of the experiment, only after four hours, they could already observe a significant uh, a signal of a resonance here. So they had to scan a really very long range and they could already after four hours get a resonance, which was very, very close. So here is the predicted position. And as you see, it's very, very close to the predicted precision. So the theory was very nice and very good in agreement. Then they switched into a more narrow band mode to look in more detail to these resonances and they could serve, observe some really interesting structures, which with the help of the theorists, they could then link to a first excitation spectrum of radium fluoride uh, molecules. And then they could also measure the excited state of the, these levels here and show that they are very short lived. And now this turns out to be a very important thing because one more thing that had then to be proven was that the decay after the excitation to the first vibrational level, the decay back into the ground state would be mostly back to the 
to this level in the ground state and not to the other levels which are also appearing in the ground state. And indeed, they could show that this is less than 5%. Now, if you have that, you have something that is excited and decays back to the same level, you have what is called a closed loop. And this is an ideal system to apply laser cooling. And why is this now important? Is because radium fluoride is an element that or a molecule that has been predicted to be the most suitable system to look for in a very efficient way for an electric dipole moment. And that is to look for new physics beyond the standard model. So the future of this now is to apply more precise techniques to apply laser cooling and then to perform really high precision studies for that purpose. And so with this, I would like to end my talk. And I hope I have made you clear that with radioactive isotopes and molecules, you can do a lot of experiments. So now that's the conclusions from my previous talk, unfortunately, but uh, I think it's also fine for this talk. Uh, in that previous talk, I focused on the laser experiment. So here I made it a little bit broader. I couldn't show any results from materials research, but next week you will get a full talk about possible studies on materials using radioactive probes from my colleague, Carl uh, Johnston. Thank you. And I'm willing to answer lots of questions now. Uh, Gerda, thanks very much. I um, really appreciate it to, for you to take the time to give us uh, all of these flavors of the physics that can be done at its all day which also tell us that uh, uh, CERN uh, not just have the particle physics experiment from uh, LHC, but there are a lot of other uh, nuclear physics related uh, experiments and even other applications that are really of interest. So uh, yes, and I want to excuse me that I gave a very short glimpse of everything because I think it's also nice to see go in a little more details for all of them, but yeah, this is of course not possible. So I haven't been too didactic, I think, but I, I wanted to give you a, a glimpse of the different possibilities. And I hope this will trigger you to look up more details on of, of one or the other experiment. Yeah, I think, I think that's definitely what we needed. So since we have uh, uh, alumni of a different background to, to for, for people to understand what are the ranges of the possibilities is uh, really is important. Okay. Um, it's other questions, uh, curiosities. Uh, I have. I know some of you guys are, um, you know, studying nuclear physics in related uh, areas. So I expect that we have questions. Hey, George, uh, so since you're not asking questions, I was just going to be calling you out. I'm here, Katev. I think I'll, I'll just ask a general question. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, a few months ago, I, I attended uh, a talk uh, from someone from his order in the West. There's actually a group here which does laser spectroscopy, so it was kind of a refresher for my part also. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very uh, good. Yeah. yeah. Just a general question. Is, is there any experiments uh, around uh, the N is equal to Z line as I, at a sword? Uh, there are also experiments close to the N equals Z line, yes. Uh, in fact, also with laser spectroscopy, we have been doing experiments, for example, on the uh, uh, isotopes very close to TIN 100, which is mm -hmm. an N equals Z nucleus, also a very exotic nucleus. Uh, there are also people doing experiments on other N equals Z nuclei um, in different elements, in fact. So yes, it's possible to study uh, physics in the N equals Z nuclei. Uh, thank you. Meiki has a question. Um, uh, do you expect any, um, any upgrades soon for isolate? I mean, in the near future. Yes, in fact, I will show you... Uh, my slide, um, because I had that in my slides. Um, so let's see. No, it's not. Ah, outlook to the future. Yes. So we we are we have a project to upgrade our facility, which is called Epic, and it stands for exploiting the full potential of Isolde at CERN. 
it, it composes a lot of components and for sure we are not going to realize all of that uh, or probably none of it in the next five years but I hope within five to 15 years we can realize a lot of this. So the point is that it, uh, at the moment CERN is upgrading its accelerators and because of that uh, the intensity of the protons will be more intense uh, at least with a factor of two maybe with a factor of three and also the proton beam energy that will be coming from the booster could be increased to 2 GeV. Now to receive those beams at Isolde we need major upgrades on our beam dumps and we also need upgrades on the transport line between the booster and Isolde. So that's an investment that we would like CERN to make uh, maybe on the next long shutdown of CERN. So that would mean uh, 2025, 26. It would give us a gain in fact an intensity of our radioactive ion beams of a factor of two to 50. So we could go even more exotic. But then along with that, uh, we would like to have a new experimental hall with two new additional target stations because we have now uh, a very compact, uh, very dense experimental hall. And at the moment, I have requests from collaborations around the world that want to bring new equipment to the hall. And we have, in fact, no or little space to put that. So we would look, like to uh, have a new hall uh, and also to have low energy and high energy experiments uh, in parallel to one another. Because at the moment they are competing with one another for beam time because they all have to be fed from the same single point of entry. At the moment we are also working currently on improving the uh, uh, mass separation capabilities. Uh, for this, this is an ongoing project and I hope we will have something working, uh, let's say within two, three years from now. It's based on these multi-reflection time of light spectrometer type experiments. Uh, these are all designed for low voltage, but if you want to have a fast throughput, you want to have a high voltage like 40 kV entering in there, and that's quite a challenge. So this development is ongoing. And on the high energy side, I didn't speak about that very much. Well, I did speak about it a bit. We also want to further upgrade our uh, post accelerator. Uh, to go really to the full 10 MeV per nucleon for all beams. Now it's possible only for light beams and we want to have it for so for the very heavy beams because it allows us to excite these isotopes at much higher energies and so to probe single particle structures a lot higher up in, in the excitation scheme of the uh, heavy beams. And that's quite unique worldwide. There's very few places where this can be done. That would be unique for his own. And then finally, there was an idea to build a storage ring uh, at uh, Isolde to inject these uh, beams from high Isolde into a storage ring and then to make, uh, for example, uh, mimic the reactions that take place in the stars. Uh, and you need a storage ring for that because otherwise uh, you don't have enough uh, react interaction cross section to make a significant experiment. But you could also do very high precision studies in the fields of atomic physics and nuclear physics with that. So we have a long list of upgrades and none of it is, um, let's say, um, sure at the moment. We are organizing a second EPIC workshop on the 24th and the 25th of November, which will be fully online. I've sent out, uh, we've sent out the announcement and if you want, I can send it uh, to your professor who can forward it to you. You are welcome to follow online where we are going to discuss in more detail several of these upgrades. Yeah, thank you. That would be great. Uh, uh, yes. Get the send it to, 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 to me and I will forward it. Yeah. 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 I'll get that. So, but is any of these, since you have to, you may have to pick, uh, which one do you think is more priority if you have to select uh, among these upgrades? Um, so the upgrades related to the, let's say, CERN accelerator complex upgrades, are the ones which we think we can get a little bit more easy from CERN because uh, it's their business as well. Um, so also 
this is something having a factor of 2 to 50 gain in, in intensity of radioactive beams is something that will benefit our whole community. So at the moment, this, way, this is our priority and we are working towards having this uh, in the CERN mandate of, uh, let's say, by uh, long shutdown three, hopefully. So we are now preparing for that. It's not in the midterm plan at the moment. Part of it is in there, but not completely. And so we are now preparing with pre-studies to get it into the planning so that it can hopefully be realized in 25, 26. That would be our priority. The second priority before having, for example, a storage ring was something we, we were discussing in the past, but there is already a lot of competition for beam time. If you then build another setup that uh, again relies on high isolated beams to compete with low energy, we think having a new additional hall with new target stations would be the second priority. As I said, there's a lot of low energy new users that want to use our beams, uh, especially in materials research, there's a lot of interest. So having first new space and new target stations to have parallel beams for low and high energy, then we can also uh, have, uh, expand with, with uh, an XL. So that is from, let's say, my point of view, and I think also the collaboration's point of view, the way to go. Of course, smaller upgrades like uh, the accelerator performance and, and the improved separation capabilities, this is something that we are taking care of with our collaboration. And this is, I think, something that will be realized uh, maybe even in the short term. Okay. Um, for the question? Sorry, Katerik. Yes. Can I ask another question again? Sure, go ahead, George. Yeah. Uh, taking you back to where you presented the the charge radii, the mean yeah. charge radii, the, the graph where you showed is it late and the struggle uh, staggering in the in the neutron diffusion. The coppers, uh, yeah. Ah, right. Uh, yeah, Chris Copper. Okay, that's the one. Uh, no, the one which shows well is a, there isn't much. Uh, ah, the the, the, the uh, strong yeah. even staggering. Uh, yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yep. Here. Yeah. The uh, yeah. the one before that, I think so. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Is it fair to? to I, I'm not sure about this question myself because I've seen this before, and I just wanted to find out. Uh, you have uh, very neutron deficient. Uh, isotones before the other side and uh, on the other end you have uh, um, isotopes with uh, high neutron numbers but in this region what is the effect of uh, the, the interaction between the, the neutrons and the protons? Do they this is very any, yeah. any, any effect in this? In yes this yeah. yes so in fact yeah so here the stable Mercuries are about in this region here, okay? So nothing special is happening. And then you remove neutrons, and then maybe it's better here to show. So in this neutron deficient uh, mercuries, the thing is that you are making holes in a particular type of neutron orbital, which has a high quantum number. So it's the neutron I13 halves orbital that gets emptied. And at the same time, uh, in the um, in the in the lead nuclei, I'm not sure I have a slide on that. No, I don't have one. Let's see quickly. But in the lead nuclei, which are just on top of the mercuries, in this region here, it's known that prolate and oplate shapes are coexisting. Uh, in the same nucleus. And now it turns out uh, these states in lead occur because of excitations of protons from below the Z equals 82 shell closure to above. And they become very low in energy. And then in these mercury isotopes, these structures are coupling to the neutrons and inducing a particular strong proton-neutron correlations between 
protons in that particular orbital, H11, uh, H9 half, which is on top of the shell collision, and I13 half neutrons, which is below the shell collision. And it's because of that particular interaction that suddenly the shape changes. And that's what was understood for the first time by these calculations that were performed here. And so this is related to well, also something that Otsuka and his uh, has uh, studied along uh, also a lot in the past uh, 10, 15 years, uh, which they call the monopole or the, st the, the strong uh, interaction, the monopole interaction between neutrons in the I13 halves and protons in the H9 halves orbital. And because of that strong interaction that is enhanced in these particular nuclei, the shape is suddenly changing. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions, last questions or comments? All right, so if not, I suggest that we stop today. You have Dr. Uh, uh, get us uh, information on, on, on the on the agenda page in case you want to, to, to contact her for, for more information. She will send information about uh, the upcoming upgrade uh, workshop online for people who may want to connect. And uh, again, we would like to thank you again. So maybe sometime in the future, when you have time, Gerda, you can come to the African School of Physics and give us a lecture there. Uh, that would be appreciated. Yes, that would be nice if I have time. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've, been as, I've been in South Africa and it was a very nice experience. So I'll be happy to come back maybe one day. Yeah, now you have to go to other parts of Africa as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So thank you very much. And thanks everybody uh, 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 who connected. So Gerda, we... I, I didn't tell you at the beginning, but we recorded the lecture and we'll put the recording on the on the Indigo page. I hope that's okay. Okay, that's fine. No problem. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.